every well, I get is morning. It's eleven thirty. Um, thanks for being here today. I was hoping we could meet in person, but this little Omicron variant had uh, different ideas. So we're going Zoom, and we're delighted that um, all you're here with us today. I also wanted to let you know that this meeting is being recorded. I hope everyone's okay with that. Um, we were just talking with Jean, like we've been doing this. I've been here 17 years, and to my knowledge, we've done this every January for 17 years. So it's like we're excited to have Jean back. I don't know what we do without her. I was just saying we could turn, instead of the gala, we'll just do a Jean event and <laughs> charge a lot of money, and it'll be a big fundraiser. <laughs> but anyways, I think everybody here knows Jean. Um, of course, the president and CEO of Acevedo Consulting. Uh, she's been working with us for how many years? Well, at least 17, probably more than that, Jean. Yeah, more than that. Yeah, about 20. Probably probably about 20. Uh, she's a compliance consultant with expertise in chart audits, compliance. Her firm assists providers in implementing effective compliance programs, including meeting HIPAA requirements, uh, expert witness in civil litigation, federal fraud cases, and serves an investigative consultant for the DOJ and the FBI on coding and compliance. So don't mess with Jean. <laughs> um, so we're delighted to have her here today and again I want to thank all of you and yes this meeting will be recorded so but I know a couple of you said you couldn't stay on the whole time so you'll be able to catch it um, after after we're done today probably not today but in a day or two so take it away oh 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 no do we have any circle of friends on the call <laughs> I forgot we want to give everyone except for Jean of course is a circle of friend in addition to being our an expert speaker any circle of friends on the call? I don't see any names. Okay, I was going to let you have a chance to introduce yourself. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with Jean. And um, she's been a as longtime circle of friend, a supporter, not only with her knowledge, but with her money. With our ideas, she serves on our board, our services board, and uh, offers a lot of direction on that as well. So she's a real gem, and we're delighted to have her. And uh, take it away, Jean. Thank you for the kind words, Deanna. All right, guys, so sit down, grab your bottle of water. Get your lunch. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, for any of you who've been through this in prior years, you know, this is this is a pretty long one. <laughs> we are not going to be finished in an hour. In fact, I was telling Deanna that just yesterday I updated the presentation because there was some new coding stuff that came out, right? And I was like, oh, wow, okay, so now I have to update all these PowerPoints. But all right, um, also remember, that because I have no idea when I do these, what the specialists and specialties are in attendance. So there are going to be areas that you're gonna sit there and go, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me, All right? So, um, because this is intended, this talk, to make sure that I don't leave anybody out, right? So bear with, bear with me um, uh, where, where, uh, Part of the topic of the part of the talk may not be specific to what your doctors do or non physician practitioners, but I promise you there's something in here for everybody. All right. So let's see if I can get this started. All right. Blah, blah, blah. There's me. Um, disclaimer at the beginning of the year, I always wanted to stop about the disclaimer. So the final 2022 Medicare physician fee schedule came out November. I've done my best to digest and now be able to communicate to you what the heck is in there that physicians need to know and, there's, and their staff. Um, but I am still waiting, and you should be as well, for Medler Matters articles, et cetera, to further explain something. So I am clearly doing the best I can to interpret those and communicate. Um, and what's interesting to me about the books, the code books, so you'll see when I, uh, cause I think I mentioned it as I go through, um, there's a modifier that won't be in your 2022 CPT code book because the AMA released it late. The update that I did yesterday for the slides is a couple of new ICD-10 codes that um, just came out. So um, you've got to make sure that not only do you have current code books, but that you are subscribing to the appropriate free resources Right, and keeping alert so that you have the um, current information and your doctors can bill and get paid correctly. All right, so what am I going to go over? All right, changes to the code sets, you know, um, and this is where I'll take you 
section by section. I am not having full descriptions of all the codes up there, nor will I go through every single added or revised CPT or HixFix code, never mind ICD-10. Um, but it is ICD-10 that has the hot off the presses, right? That won't be in your handout. And then after I go through the codes, some of the most important things that, at least in my estimation, that was in the fee schedule rule, this thing called splitter shared visits that's been around for eons, but now has a totally different um, definition and indications for payment. Uh, some changes for physician assistants that the PAs I'm sure are happy about. I'm gonna talk from a compliance perspective about one of the Medicare enrollment changes because I have a feeling that most of you will be um, unaware of what the area, the path I'm gonna take. And then I know everybody still has questions about telehealth this year and whatever else, right? Too many things for an agenda slide. All right, codes, CPT codes. And as, as this slide says, these are highlights. Not every code, it's not complete descriptions, Never mind, is it all the guidelines or um, parenthetical notes, et cetera. There were a significant number of changes this year. As you can see, about uh, 249 CPT codes were added, 63 deleted, um, and 93 had revisions, right? So that's a significant amount of changes for you guys. So I don't know what your process is, but I know what mine is. When I get my CPT code book, I go to the back of the book, to the, um, to the section, the appendix that lists all the changes. No, it doesn't have all the definitions, et cetera, but you know what code sets that your doctors and non-physician practitioners bill, right? So if you've got physical therapy in your orthopedic practice, you know if you go through that list and you see codes starting 9-7, they're liable to be ones that impact you, right? And you should go then to go see what the changes are, et cetera, right? So it's a great place to start. <clears throat> so significant number of changes. Um, going to take each section with some highlights. Evaluation and management. No, there are no major changes like we had last year. Although I am so delighted that most every, if not every physician that I've worked with over the last year and a month now with the new office visit requirements is deliriously happy about the changes. So um, I think the AMA is working on making similar changes to other codes, hospital visits, et cetera, that we might see for 2023. But what did they change this year? Something minimal. That nurse visit, right, 99211. Um, I put up the full definition for you here and just um, redlined the area that comes out. So nothing really changed from I'm sure what you're doing day to day, but do know that it has a little bit of a different description. And the reason the AMA changed it was to have this evaluation and management service code for office or their outpatient visits be more in line with the changes that they made last year to the other office visit codes, right? So, um, and as you'll notice, there's nothing any longer that says that the typical time is like five minutes. So there's no time in this. So um, this is still has the same requirements, you know, and to give you an example of what this might be so, so I saw that there was a rheumatology practice logging on as, as we were waiting. So this is the visit that you would charge if the doctor wants the patient to start on say methotrexate and the patient is told by the doctor to come in and the nurse will help the patient um, learning how and instruct them into the self-injection, right? So can you bill for that? As long as all the criteria are met, there's documentation, a doctor in the office, et cetera. Yeah, that's that 99211. So. Um, that, so minor change for that. The evaluation and management service uh, also has some changes to remote physiologic monitoring. Now, do know that, and I'm still finding this confusing, that there is also a second, what do I wanna call it? A second type of service for remote monitoring that's remote uh, therapeutic monitoring. <sighs> Why it's in a whole other section of the book and not right with the remote physiologic monitoring, um, I don't understand, but oh well, right? You know, that's just me. So there have been some revisions to the remote physiologic monitoring. 
um, including some clarification uh, that there is a requirement for live interactive communication with the patient when billing for um, treatment management services of so the clinical staff, physician, or other qualified healthcare professional, time in a calendar month requiring interactive communication. So there actually has to be documentation of some back and forth, right? Um, also understand that if it wasn't clear to you before, the full 20 minutes must be met. And I know more and more practices are um, using remote physiologic monitoring for some things. And um, it's not enough to think about the CPT rules for time in general that says you can use the code when you've passed the midpoint. Well, if you went to CPT's introduction and read that about time, you'd also see that in that definition, it says something to the effect of, unless there's a rule otherwise uh, for that particular service, right? So for remote physiologic monitoring, for chronic care management, et cetera, you have to have provided the full number of minutes, in this case, 20 minutes, right? So, um, and do know that this is, if you look at the definition, it's not just the doctor or your nurse practitioner or PA, it says clinical staff. So they can provide the services under this code. Um, obviously the doctor has to order it, et cetera. And notice this um, revision in the guidelines in my final bullet that says that one of the requirements to report the, um, the time, so the service at all, is if the physician or qualified healthcare professional use the results of remote physiologic monitoring to manage a patient under a specific treatment plan. So someone, the doctor, has to develop a treatment plan, right? And the results of whatever the, the um, remote physiologic monitoring is, there needs to be documentation that it's been used in the care and treatment of the patient. Makes sense, but I would urge you, if you're providing this uh, service, to go back and look to make sure your documentation speaks to that. Um, also in the evaluation management section, there are some guidelines changes for care management. And in fact, the whole section guidelines have been revised. And pretty much that's uh, one of the reasons for that is the fact that principal care management, so basically chronic care management with a twist, rather than needing to have a patient with two chronic conditions that need some management throughout the month, it's one chronic condition. Um, uh, and it's meant for specialists rather than primary care physicians, right? So clearly with the new code set, they needed to update the guidelines, but the guidelines also have been changed um, to reflect the care planning, uh, chronic care management itself, and the complex chronic care management. Um, the CMS is really pushing folks in a nice way, I meant that to provide these care management services through studies that they have commissioned, it has been shown that over the long term, patients who receive these care management services are more satisfied with the care they're giving, um, the quality of their care goes up, and nicely at the same time, CMS has noted an overall reduction in Medicare payments. Right. So the doctor payments may go up, right, because they're billing for a service that didn't exist half a dozen years ago, um, but overall payments. So how many trips does the patient make to the emergency room? Um, the heart failure patient, how many times are they readmitted to the hospital? Not as much, right, because they're getting monitored and managed through the course of a month. So overall, it's saving money. So, um, and as I mentioned, the principal care management that came out a year ago had HICS-PICS codes, so those alphanumeric codes that CMS creates when there aren't CPT or it disagrees with the definitions in CPT um, have been deleted and replaced with new CPT codes. So just a couple of um, highlights of the changes in the care planning instructions. The plan of care should include specific and achievable, achievable goals for each condition and be relevant to the patient's well-being and lifestyle. Um, and I was reviewing a uh, care plan for an organization a couple of months ago, and the patient had a laundry list of conditions, not surprising. Um, and the two chronic conditions that were chosen to 
uh, for the chronic care management was, let me see, hyperlipidemia and let's just say hypertension, right? And as I looked through all the assessment, et cetera, and the questionnaire to see how the patient was doing, what goals they had for those conditions, the patients, two, those two conditions were totally under control. So the patient said, I don't ever have any goals. Understand that chronic care management must be medically necessary, right? It's not a preventive service that can be happen once a year, like an annual wellness visit, screening mammogram. It must be medically necessary. And just because I have two chronic conditions doesn't mean chronic care management would be medically necessary and payable. In this particular case, as I delved into the medical record more, I couldn't help but notice that the patient also had some form of arthritis and had joint swelling and was talking about the pain in the morning, et cetera. And I remember thinking, why wasn't this a condition that the doctor's office was providing chronic care management for? Here is clearly something where goals could be um, created for the patient uh, as well-being and lifestyle, et cetera. So think about that with your chronic care management or principal care management if you're a specialist. Um, also, it's clear in CPT now that the patient needs to get a copy of the care plan. That's always been a requirement. They've really just made it by Medicare. It's really clear now in CPT. And since the complex chronic care management requires a level of complexity of medical decision-making, moderate or high, nothing ever pointed us to, okay, what's the underlying basis for that? What do I use to determine if I meet the complexity perspective, or even for transitional care management, right? So if I see the patient within seven days and the medical decision-making is of high complexity, what do I use? So um, what's interesting now is that the CMS says that the moderate or high decision-making requirement um, is defined in the evaluation and management guidelines. The reason I say that's interesting is the fact that we have two sets of guidelines now. If it's an office visit, we have the new 2021. If it's a hospital visit, we have the old um, three variables for medical decision making. So I'm not quite sure how we'll figure that out, but oh well. Um, principal care management, as I've mentioned, services that focus. Uh, I don't know if you can see me, right? But um, I have a dog in the house that's busy, bigger, a little bit bigger to say the least than my little cockapoo. So if you see a huge silver blue head ever in the screen, it's Athena, family members, great day, wandering around my house. All right, principal care management, same type of thing as I mentioned as chronic care management, only they're meant for use by specialists. If a patient has one chronic condition that, um, would really benefit from some monitoring management over the course of just a few months. So we have new CPT codes to replace the uh, HCPCS codes that were in existence before. And just as with chronic care management, they're broken down to a set for the physician or non-physician practitioner, and another set if it's the clinical staff that provides the principal care management. And I really do encourage uh, specialists to provide principal care management for the appropriate patients. And you don't have to worry about whether or not, um, if you do that, that the primary care physician won't be able to bill for their chronic care management. It's allowed. You also don't have to worry about, well, wait a minute, if I bill principal care management for the heart failure, I know the patient's got COPD. What if the pulmonologist is also billing for principal care management? Will my claims get denied? Nope, nope. So um, when CMS created this uh, benefit category, this uh, code set, I should say, in the benefit category of care management, they were very clear that uh, more than one physician can be providing the specific care management. So no worries there. All right, finished with ENM. Anesthesia, there was a group of about five or six codes that were added this year. Um, anesthesia doesn't often have any changes, but these are one, two, three, yeah, six codes for percutaneous image guidance for anatomical location of the spine. So if you look at these, for anybody who may have an anesthesia practice, you'll see that they are, um, the codes vary based on the specific area of the spine. Surgery. All right. So the whole surgical section had about 24 or so new codes. 
What I find interesting is this change to the guidelines for or definition, I should say, for foreign body or implant. And what's also interesting is that that same definition is in two other sections of the code book. All right, so I guess the AMA is really trying to make sure that we get it. So if your doctor, non-physician practitioner does indeed have any time where they are quote unquote removing a foreign body um, or that um, they're placing an implant, they now have a very clear definition of what those two things are, right? So in an object that's intentionally placed um, for any purpose, whether diagnostic or therapeutic is considered an implant an object that is unintentionally placed through trauma or ingestion is considered a foreign body. Now, do note that a foreign body means something foreign. So it is not an eyelash in the eye. So the code for removing a foreign body from the eye should not be used. If um, I had an eyelash stuck under my lid, um, it's not foreign, it's actually part of me. Um, an ingrown hair or for ENT or other internal medicine, it's not a hair in the ear that you pull out. It is nothing foreign about it. It's my hair, et cetera, right? So, um, so very interesting that we have a very specific definition now. For the integumentary system, most of the most important changes to me were a change in the guidelines. So wait, did you notice something? Did you notice a theme? seem to be an awful lot of changes to guidelines, to guidelines, definitions. So since I stopped myself, this is where I need to remind you guys, it's not enough to just look to see what new deleted revised codes might exist for services and items provided in your practice. You have to go through those sections that you know you code from and look at the guidelines, parenthetical notes under codes, et cetera, to see what's different. Right. Um, and in fact, it made me think about it here because in the integumentary system, the AMA has made some clarifications. It's not really a change. Clarifications as to what's a repair. In other words, when can you bill at all for repair, even simple repair? Because they had noticed that there was some what they called misunderstanding. So, um, so. The repair or closure area, use the codes in this section to designate wound closure utilizing sutures, staples, or tissue adhesives, either singly or in combination with each other or in combination with adhesive strips. So if you see this, knowing that there's no when performed or any other qualifying statements, there need to be sutures, sta uh, staples, tissue adhesive, one or more of those to be able to code a repair at all. Right? Um, chemical cauterization, electrocauterization, wound closure using uh, adhesive strips as the sole repair material, not wound repair. You can't use a repair code if that's all you did. That um, closure would be included in the doctor and non-physician practitioners evaluation and management service. And excuse me, even simple repair to make sure you understand, the guidelines have been um, also revised additionally so that it says simple repair is used when the wound is superficial um, and requires simple one layer closure. Hemostasis and local or topical anesthesia when performed are not reported separately. So, simple one layer closure. So again, if there aren't staples or some sutures or something, it is not a repair, not even a simple repair. So important to understand the guidelines, right? So uh, let's see, what did my little pop-up say? Anything that I haven't said so far? Uh, nope, I think I said that already. All right, musculoskeletal. The introduction guidelines are significantly revised for fracture care. Any orthopedist doing, or any emergency department docs doing any fracture care need to make sure that they understand this section, read the new guidelines and digest what it says because there are several concept changes that will either make or break you when it comes to proper coding and billing. 
So um, the application, some of the highlights, the application and removal of the first cast splint or traction device is included in all services in this, that section of the CPT code book. Um, if a cast is removed by someone other than the provider who applied it, the cast removal codes can be reported, right? And that makes sense. Subsequent replacement of a cast splint or strapping or traction device during or after the global period may be reported separately. Sure. So the 90 day global period is over and I have to replace your, um, your traction device. Sure, I get to bill for it. There's no longer a global period that it's bundled into, right? Um, treatment codes in this section of the CPT book are structured by the type of treatment and the type of stabilization. And one of the things that this uh, change to the guidelines is trying to make clear to everybody from a coding perspective, you code it by the type, you code, you code the treatment based on the type of treatment, regardless of what type of a fracture was, right? So um, a closed treatment, I'm sorry, open treatment can happen for a closed fracture. Right? So um, let me see if there's anything else I wanna really point out here. Ah, yeah, this last one, closed treatment, part of the new definition. A casting, splinting, or strapping used solely to temporarily stabilize the fracture for patient comfort is not considered closed treatment. So my, my mind went to the bottom bullet isn't from CPT, it comes from my head, is that the temporary cast splint uh, or, or cast or splint put on in the emergency department until the patient can be seen by the orthopedist um, the ED doc bills the appropriate evaluation and management code. That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, and so for those of you who provide this service, important that you uh, read the new guidelines. Then there's a whole new subheading of reporting fracture and dislocation treatment codes. Um, just some basic instructions speaks to the split uh, pre, intra and post-surgical code billing, modifier 54, et cetera. So um, anybody again doing this type of service really needs to review that section. All right, cardiovascular system. Lots of changes for pacemaker and other implantable device guidelines, new codes, et cetera. And this is where I say almost every year, who is the cardiologist who has ticked off someone on the AMA CPT editorial advisory panel? because you guys always have changes. Uh, in fact, this year, the changes are again so extensive with new subsections, et cetera, that I firmly believe that every cardiology practice should, in addition to the new CPG code book, should purchase maybe like 70 some odd dollars on Amazon, the AMA CPT changes for 2022, where it gives the rationale for these code changes, additions, guideline changes, and also gives clinical examples for the doctor. So coding and billing needs to know this stuff, but those codes, codes from the CPT code book need to be shared with the doctor um, so that they know how to document. Bear with me one second. So I'm hoping when you guys, um, do this, Deanna, that you can do some editing because I can tell that this larger dog needs to go out and text the family member, see if they can come take care of that. Um, all right, back on track. And there are all kinds of uh, additions, deletions, et cetera, right? New subsection of endovascular repair, of congenital heart and vascular defects, right? With new codes and guidelines because it didn't exist before. So there's a real demarcation now between um, acquired or um, congenital heart and vascular defects. Right? So, um, the new code in the digestive system, although I think more that this is probably ENT than gastroenterology for a drug-induced sleep endoscopy uh, with dynamic evaluation of vellum, pharynx, tongue base, and larynx for evaluation of sleep disorder breathing, flexible diagnostic, Prior to this new code 42975, what the AMA saw was that when this uh, service was provided, 
the doctors were all over the map billing flexible laryngoscopies, 31575, uh, or nasal and, and sinus endoscopies, 31231, et cetera. So there was clearly no code that correctly captured the service. So now 42975. Um, and this is not an office procedure because the requirements are clear that this is under anesthesia in an operative setting, right? So um, uh, this is at least an outpatient, uh, outpatient ASC or hospital procedure code. For the urologist, a ah, couple little changes between the males and the females, but not a lot. The interesting thing is that there are some category three codes, those new technology codes that are, have been converted to category one or what I like to call real CPT codes um, to report periuteral transperineal balloon continence device procedures. And you know, certain things when I do this presentation make me stop to hopefully impart additional messages. So those category three codes, when you get the CPT code book, and again, I'm really assuming that everybody has a 2022 CPT code book by now. Um, in addition to looking in the um, appendix to see, okay, what codes have changed and then looking to make sure in your billing sections um, that uh, you've read the guidelines, that you know you're still reporting the services correctly. Uh, excuse me, you also need to go to the category three section in the back of the book. I forget which appendix that one is. Because category three codes, those new technology, that T, right? Um, the Cliff Notes version as to where they come from, physicians, specialty societies, others basically petition the AMA CPT editorial advisory, advisory panel for, hey, we have this new service, this new technique, this new way of doing something, and uh, we need a code for that. And there may not be um, enough evidence to show that it's widely used, et cetera, if they're successful in speaking to the AMA, there'll be a new technology code that will be added, right? These codes in the back of the book. Some of them, as in this case, eventually it converted from, new, from the uh, category three to category one, those real CPT codes. And we want the real CPT codes, right? Not every payer pays for the new technology codes, category three, but pretty much everybody pays for a CPT code. So how do they get there? Well, the AMA looks at the data over about a five-year period. And if nobody's using it, they go away. And all of a sudden there aren't any codes for that item or service. But if there is a, enough utilization, then we get a category one code. So in this case, for this uh, urologic procedure, the latter instance was indeed the case. There are also revisions to the repair, revision ah. of, whoops. Ah. <laughs> this is ah. one of the downsides of continuing ah. to work remote and I refuse ah. to go to the office every day with the new variant that's been around for a while. So bear with me for a second. I have a feeling that this is going to continue for a moment. So I don't want to, all right, I think it's stopped. All right, so revisions to the male uh, genitalia, the penis for hypospadias has uh, revisions to the codes and maternity care and delivery, um, surgical treatment of ectopic pregnancy, interstitial uterine pregnancy requiring total hysterectomy. That code's been deleted. Why? Nobody's using it, right? So if you're the one GYN who was using it, doesn't exist anymore. Dean, we have a and question. Sure. Um, can you re can you please review the new subchondroplasty code 0707 T? Are there NCCI edits and can we bill with scope? Okay, so I'm not I'm not prepared to answer that question here. Remember, I don't go over every code, and I don't remember since I do have a section on some of the new technology codes. If I have it. I'm happy to answer the question after the fact. And um, when you guys send out maybe the link for the recording for anybody who wants it, you can also include the answer. But I'm not even in the new technology section of this presentation yet, so sorry. There are a whole bunch of new codes. I don't have them all in my head. <laughs> so 
Anything else that maybe something that I could answer right now about what I'm talking about? I guess that's that the would only be question enough. I had so far. All right, thanks, Mindy. Thank you. Sure. All right. In the nervous system, um, there are two new codes for laser interstitial thermal therapy for treatment of intracranial lesions and revised guidelines for the spine and spinal cord injection, drainage, and aspiration codes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And some of the revised guidelines for the neurologist or interventional pain docs performing these procedures have to do with when you do and do not also report uh, fluoroscopic guidance. So important to look at. For ophthalmology, um, category three codes again, right? A bunch of T codes have been replaced with new uh, CPT codes 66989 and 66991. And these are used to report various insertion procedures that happen at the same time as a cataract extraction. And because of that, ophthalmologists need to review the section guidelines and parenthetical notes for cataracts themselves um, because they've been understandably revised as well. There's also a new code 68941 for insertion of drug eluting implant, including punctal dilation, when performed in lacrimal uh, can caniculus each. So um, this was also the result of deleting category three codes. So as you see, there are codes that doctors can use routinely to report the services provided that started off as category three codes, right? And as they take hold in the medical community and are reported on the claims, all of a sudden we have the uh, category one regular CPT codes that can be used. Uh, auditory, there were a couple of revised codes in this section, but it's really um, not any of those that most ENTs are using, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, because it's to report the magnet, magnetic, magnetic transcutaneous attachment to an external speech processor for implementation or revision or replacement of an osseo-integrated osseo implant. So not a common uh, procedure, but one that some, uh, some otolaryngologists definitely provide. All right, those are some of the highlights from the surgical section. Radiology, about four new codes, nothing big here. There is indeed some um, updated introductory language and yep, that definition of a foreign body and implant is in this section of the book too, right? So it applies to both uh, the general guidelines at the beginning in the surgical section and radiology. The AMA really wants to make sure that regardless of the type of service you're providing, you understand what the definition of those things are. Um, there are a bunch of new category three codes for, for, um, for radiology that are referenced. And the four new codes really have to do with trabecular bone scores uh, procedures. So 77089 through 77092. That was the really the only substantive code change that I could identify in the radiology section. Pathology and lab, well, there are a bunch of, bunch of new codes, about 31, and that doesn't include the PLA codes, which uh, someone one day will have to provide me with a better explanation of what those proprietary lab codes are than everything I've read because I still don't totally understand it. I do know enough to know that that doesn't impact the typical doctor's office. So there are 30 some odd new codes in pathology and lab. They're scattered throughout the section. Um, none of them really would impact the typical doctor's office, even if you have a moderately complex lab, as I looked at it. The one area that I found so interesting with changes in the, this section of CPT had to do with the pathology clinical consultations. That's been overhauled. Holy expletive, right? So any pathologist who provide the clinical consults really needs to be provided with this new section of the book. Um, there are new and revised guidelines and they don't look anything like what the, the clinical pathologists are used to seeing. Um, there's a new table to identify a level of medical decision-making because all of a sudden, which code the pathologist uses has to do for one, with the level of medical decision-making. And trust me, 
Now we have another definition of medical decision-making that looks nothing like that what we have for evaluation and management services. So um, not at all the same. Um, each clinical pathologist is going to need to have these uh, new definitions and guidelines uh, provided to them and be able to digest, have some education, something, or the, the code, their coding of the new clinical pathology codes, 80503 through 80506, won't be supported by the appropriate clinical documentation. This was a huge change for these folks. All right, medicine section of the book. We're getting near the end of the CPT code book. About 36 or so new codes. In the guidelines, here she goes being facetious, the darn speaker. Guess what has been updated? What new definition? Yeah, you got it. Foreign body or implant definition. It's here as well. Um, message is clear. Make sure you understand what that is. Don't code anything about a foreign body removal or an, an implant insertion without making sure that the definition has been, uh, that the item meets the definition, right? So interesting. Um, immunization administration. So there have been a lot of revisions to the guidelines. And uh, some of that has to do with the new COVID vaccine codes. Um, so hopefully, each of you has also received information on those as they've come out, especially if you're providing the vaccine. Um, there is now some real good clarification for the general uh, vaccine immunization codes. You know, there's this code set 90460 and 61 that has had a component of counseling of the patient, or in the case of a child, the parent or guardian. And the guideline has been revised to make it really clear that you can't build those codes if the office nurse has provided a sheet to the parent or to the patient. Um, the 90460 and 61 codes are only used when the physician or non-physician practitioner provides face-to-face -face counseling of the patient or family during the administration of the vaccine. So this means that the doctor, the nurse practitioner actually has to have had a conversation um, while they're with the patient. Right? If there isn't any, not like you can't bill for the administration, you would just use the 90471 through 74 codes that um, don't include counseling of the patient. Right? So that's gonna be a big change, especially for a lot of pediatricians. And then, um, COVID, you know, boy, you really got to be on your toes if you're um, administering any vaccines uh, for COVID because as things change, the codes have been changing. Um, I'm hoping that most of you or at least someone else in your practice is on CMS's e-list, right? So that as they make changes um, to the codes, especially the HICSPICS codes or work with the AMA for new CPT codes, that um, you're getting notified um, on a proactive basis, right? So, but the codes for administration of the COVID vaccine are a bit confusing. Now there's a nice table in the CPT code book to refer to, but it's based on the type of vaccine, which dose is it? Is my first dose of Pfizer? My second dose? Is it a third dose? Because clinically I needed a third dose or is it the booster? Right, so even for one vaccine, there are at least four different codes. So um, very, very interesting to me, but seriously, um, seriously important that you have the uh, new code book for any of this. All right, so in the uh, medicine section under psychiatric, the 90785 is not a new code. I gotta admit, I work with a fair number of psychologists and psychiatrists. I've never come across this code, so I found it interesting. Um, it's interactive complexity, and it's an add-on code. So the clinician would only bill this in addition to some other psychotherapy they're billing. The guidelines have been revamped. Um, so it's an, the interactive complexity refers to specific communication factors that complicate the delivery of a psychiatric procedure. And I looked at that and went, oh, that's very interesting. And they list 
I think, yeah, four um, circumstances that would qualify for the use of this code. Here's an example, caregiver emotions or behavior that interfere with the caregiver's understanding and ability to assist in the implementation of the treatment plan. So the mother is, you know, um, so upset um, or confused about what's going on with their child's um, behavioral um, issues, um, that it's added some interactive complexity, right, to the clinician's coding. So very interesting. Um, if you provide any of those services, read the whole thing. And then diagnose, dialysis and end-stage renal disease services. There are some changes in parenthetical notes, didn't spot any new codes. Um, you know, some of the notes tell you not to report end-stage renal disease services with principal care management in the same time period, you know, things that make sense. Ophthalmology and otolaryngology, didn't spot anything new in this section for ophthalmology. Um, there was one change in the um, guidelines for audiologic function tests for um, ENT, and there have been about three codes that have been deleted because they, again, the low utilization, right? In fact, in this case, they're not uh, really part of the battery of tests that audiologists use. Um, and there are newer codes that have come out in the past, right, for audio, audio, uh, auditory evoked potential testing. So a little bit of changes there. Cardiology, shocker, even in this section, in the medicine section for cardiology, there are new codes. Um, and more specific, well, more specifically than the codes is the new cardiac cath guidelines, right? So um, again, cardiologists need to have someone print them print them, print out for them the new codes and the guidelines. And my recommendation again would be for this or any specialty that says, wow, I need some more information about these codes that I do this, whatever this is a lot, get the AMA CPT changes for 2022 book. Um, I don't know how I would actually understand some of these changes and interpret them correctly myself without having that additional um, explanatory book at my fingertips, right? So. Um, there are, uh, excuse me, new instructions and parenthetical notes, new category three codes. So cardiology, even in the medicine section, um, especially if you're an interven interventional or EP cardiologist, a lot of changes. Um, other changes in the medicine section, there are new outpatient pulmonary rehab codes. Here's what I had mentioned when I was talking about the remote physiologic monitoring. There's a whole new section for remote therapeutic monitoring with new codes, obviously, if it's a whole new section, 98975 through 98981. And I got to admit, I am still digesting exactly how these codes are used. Um, they are intended to report remote monitoring of non-physiologic parameters. So you know, through the years since the uh, remote physiologic uh, monitoring codes came out, I've had doctors ask me, so Jean, if a patient reports their pain scales, can I use it for that? And my answer was always, no, for the remote therapeutic monitoring, there must be an FDA device that is transmitting um, the information, et cetera, right? So no self-report. Here, it sounds as if um, that, okay, the system itself, our healthcare reimbursement system, has, um, has recognized the fact that to monitor the, to, to allow a clinician to report and get paid for reviewing and monitoring other data, the signs and symptoms of the patient, right? So more of the subjective data is indeed worth, um, worth reimbursing for. So more information, I'm sure, to come, but a couple of examples here. The most logical one for me is like therapy adherence or the response to therapy. And I don't necessarily mean physical therapy, right? So then again, these things would be done during the course of a month, et cetera. If you're interested, you got to read the whole section of the CPT code book. All right, a couple of the categories. We have codes. a question, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, if a patient reports sugar levels throughout a week, can we use one of these codes? So there is a continuous glucose monitoring um, if the patient has a device like that Libra device, that there is a code for that already. 
Um, there, it, it, it may be that just a verbal patient report is okay, but you'd have to go in to read the definitions. I guarantee you there's a time component to these codes. So a three minute phone call where the patient tells the doctor that my blood sugar each morning right after breakfast has been X, right? Or the range of X to Y is not going to be it, right? Um, there is definitely gonna be uh, time. And by time, I mean actual minute requirements just as for the remote physiologic monitoring. But until we hear otherwise, yeah, it is indeed possible. But be careful if the patient has one of those um, continuous glucose monitoring devices that they're reporting from, that has its own code. So you wouldn't use this code instead. All right, thanks, Mindy. All right, just a sample of some of the category three codes. Um, I think I picked a couple of cardiology codes because cardiology is, takes such a hit, but um, they do indeed have an awful lot of uh, services that, um, that wind up being real category one CBT codes. 0650T, which is remote um, programming of like the patient's uh, pacemaker, right? So, and that happens now, right? A technician comes to the patient's home, um, hooks the patient up, patient, uh, the physician is there, right? Via a tablet or something. I mean, really kind of face-to-face, -face, only just not in person. Um, so because that is a growing area, a growing me method, to do uh, pacer checks and reprogramming, there is a new category three code to capture that, right? So it's a great example as to um, how these, uh, how we get the category three codes, right? So, um, all right, so that's all I'm gonna do in category three because they're not listed. So if you go to the back of the book to category three codes, they're not divided into specialty areas as the front part of the CPT code book is for the category one codes. They're kind of just added as they come along, right? So you do have to kind of scroll through. But if you're looking for new codes, hopefully your book looks like mine. The new codes have a red dot, so they're easy to spot. All right, modifiers. And there are some changes to modifiers this year. So if we have any pediatricians um, who are attending, there is a revision to modifier 63, which is uh, any procedure performed on infants that weigh less than four kilograms. And um, the important thing here really is to note that that modifier 63 can be used in, uh, on all CBT codes from the range of 20100 through 69999 um, uh, to indicate the increased complexity in the phys of, and physician work for those types of uh, infants but it also clear that you don't add it to an evaluation management code, nothing from radiology or pathology or the medicine section, right? So it's very specific to code range. So um, probably good for the pediatricians. We have a new modifier 93 um, that came out. This will not be in your CPT code book. So you've got the link down the bottom of the slide to where you can find this actual um, um, notice about modifier 93. So you can read the whole thing. I'm not gonna read it, right? But this is basically telehealth that was rendered via telephone only, right? So there was no audio video of the patient, right? So uh, approved by the AMA's editorial panel in September last year, released to the AMA's website, just where are we, what's today the 12th? Barely two weeks ago. And it is effective January 1, 22. So as I read this, I'm going, well, okay, that's great. There is a modifier to, to use to report that, but when would you use it? Do you report it on the telephone codes, the 994412 and three, because they're telephone only? And I'm thinking, mm, probably not, even though those are listed as approved telehealth for now, because the codes themselves tell us that this is telephone only, right? No audio video. So I think, where, and you wouldn't use it on a regular evaluation and management code, because if you're doing evaluation and management, so that office visit, via telephone only, you would use the telephone only codes that I just referenced. So, but there are a, a number, great number of other services, so the codes listed on the approved list of telehealth 
that aren't addressed by, you know, okay, if it's an office visit of audio, uh, if it would have been an office visit, audio, video, report the e &M code. If it would have been an office visit, it's telephone only, report the telephone codes, right? Like advanced care planning discussions, which are on the list of approved or covered telehealth services and are, have an indicator to tell us that, oh, and you can do this audio only, right? So I think it's for that. So more, I'd be looking for more information to come from CMS on this modifier. Um, CMS itself, has a couple of new, about four important new um, HixPix modifiers here, FQ and FR. So FQ is defined as the service was furnished using audio only communication technology. And some of you are going, wait, didn't she just say that was modifier 93? Mm, yes and no. So um, this is where to just read a code or a modifier definition without going further to understand guidelines can be dangerous. This is used to identify mental health telehealth services furnished um, via audio only, right? So um, not an office visit, not an advanced care planning, et cetera, right? So only for those using, providing telehealth via audio only, would it be appropriate to use the FQ modifier? And then FR, the supervising practitioner was present through two-way audio video communication technology. Well, I haven't found a darn thing on that, but here's where my mind goes when I saw that modifier. So many of you may know that during the public health emergency and we're still there, it's actually slated to end on the 16th. So I'd be surprised if Secretary Becerra's didn't extend it for another 90 days, but we're down, we're gonna be down to the wire again, right? So. Um, during the public health emergency, when you're providing services incident to, so the patient has come in for an, an injection, um, the patient's getting an infusion, they're coming in for that training on how to self-inject a medication, whether it be their insulin or methotrexate, right? Incident two, you build the office nurse's services under the patient's doctor. So incident two services require that there be a doctor in the office suite. CMS was given some leniency during the public health emergency by Congress in the CARES Act to um, allow direct supervision, normally physician in the office suite, to mean if the doctor, that supervising doctor was available via telehealth. But the telehealth must be audio video. So it can't just be that you could pick up the phone if the patient had a reaction to, I don't know, the allergen immunotherapy, right? Whatever the heck it is. It literally must be that the doctor is available, uh, audio, video. My thought, just my thought, but again, I haven't seen any, any uh, explanatory documents from CMS about FR, is that when that's the case, so you're billing a 99211, for teaching the patient, whatever it might be, and the doctor is available if needed via telehealth, audio, video, you'd build a 99211 with the modifier FR, Frank Robert, right? So um, I haven't seen anything that say it's required yet either. So keep your eyes and ears open for those of you who are continuing to have patients come in when the doctor isn't actually on site for uh, incident two services, but would indeed be available through audio, video, telehealth. Interesting. And then there, I'm going to talk about split or shared visits in a moment, but um, there's another new modifier that many of you will use, FS, Frank Sam, which is split or shared evaluation and management visit. Um, so know that anytime your nurse practitioner, physician assistant, and the physician have both seen the patient today um, in the circumstances where that's allowed, but I have to be real careful with my wording due to the changes to this uh, covered service. Um, every single time, regardless of who you bill under, modifier FS should be on the evaluation management claim. And another FT, Frank Thomas, new Hicks-Fix modifier, um, and this is meant for the surgeon who is providing critical care during the global period of the surgical procedure he or she performed. Um, and <clears throat> wait, is that the right one? Wait, let me make sure. P 
post op, yes, right? And, uh, um, but the critical care is unrelated to the surgical procedure. So this was in, is intended to give surgeons the ability to bill for something that they probably weren't getting paid for before when the circumstances, i.e. unrelated to the surgery, right, um, are indeed met. All right, I actually had nothing on ICD-10 until yesterday, last night, because they've been, the new codes have been in place since October 1 last year, so it seemed kind of after the fact. But yesterday I got wind of a new set of uh, COVID vaccine status, ICD-10 codes, that will be in effect April 1st. So they're not in effect yet, just published. So um, again, they won't, they won't be in your ICD-10 code book, but they've, been, they've had uh, three codes added to chapter 21, which is the factors influencing health status and contact with health services. There's a whole new subcategory, Z28.31, which is under immunization status for COVID-19 status. So it's specifically for uh, patients who have um, not had all the recommended um, shots for the vaccine that they're getting and the booster, right? So Z28.310 speaks for itself, unvaccinated for COVID-19. Um, Z28.31, partially vaccinated, and here I have a cheat sheet on this that one of my colleagues found for me. Um, partially vaccinated for COVID may be assigned when the patient has received at least one dose of a multi-dose COVID-19 vaccine regimen, but has not received the full set of doses necessary to meet the CDC's definition of fully vaccinated, right? Okay, so it, it is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, and then Z28.39 is other under immunization status. Let me see if there was anything that kind of spoke to that and that she was kind enough to give to me here. Let's see, under immun, ah, delinquent immunization status. Oh, okay, so I guess I'm late getting my second shot or my booster um, or a lapse in immunization schedule status. Okay, so I guess I got my first and my second, or in some cases there's a third that isn't even the booster. Um, and um, the time has gone by, last immunization, yeah. The time has gone by when I should have had the, the, the next dose, right? So if the doctor is addressing, as a lot of doctors are nowadays, whether or not the patient has been vaccinated and where they are in the vaccination process, we now have, ICD-10 codes are reporting that status. These are probably not anything that has to do with reimbursement, not even from a risk environment for those of you in Medicare risk adjustment practices, whether partially or fully, but it is important information, right? If you think about the, what we've all been going through now for what, uh, almost a full two years, that um, um, the, having the data to know where we all are in the process here in, in uh, surmounting this COVID ridiculous virus that's been running rampant um, is important for public health officials to know, to try to come up with a reasonable plan. All right, so enough of the codes. Now I wanna talk about the fee schedule rule. So as you can see, I'm gonna talk about shared visits, critical care, physician assistance, Medicare enrollment changes. And for that, I'm actually interjecting a compliance piece that I want to make sure everybody understands, real important, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, payment reductions, and of course, where are we right now with telehealth? There may be something else I've snuck in, who knows? Yeah, like this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've got this very convoluted formula for determining the actual payment for a code with RVUs and geographic practice cost indexes for where, where the clinician is, Conversion factors, et cetera, right? So the conversion factor went down this year. Um, the good news after I put this together is that we do have a partial reprieve for the 2% sequestration. So if my understanding is correct, we're liable to see a slight increase in some payments um, the beginning of the year. And then unless somebody acts again in Washington, boy, isn't this tiring, we go through this all the time. 
um, then uh, they may go down a little bit. So we shall see. But um, a conversion factor that goes down basically a dollar and 30 cents can have a del real deleterious impact on um, everybody's reimbursement. All right. Uh, and you know your patient's deductible went up this year to what, $233. So if you're uh, in a position to be collecting that, um, it went up a significant amount. So, um, all right, this is an important thing. So I don't not, I'm always, because I, this needs its own talk, but I am afraid that if I don't discuss this through my update talks, that there will be going to be a bunch of you coding and billing for your nurse practitioner, physician assistant services under the doctor that um, you're gonna find yourself having to pay back money should the payer ever look. All right, so split or shared visits. There'd been a definition of this for as long as I can remember in the CMS manual. Um, it was challenged at the beginning of 2021 because it had never gone through any um, uh, rulemaking process with public comment, like the fee schedule rule does. So CMS actually removed the definition requirements guidelines for split or shared visits last early spring from the CMS manual system until it could promulgate a rule, the physician fee schedule rule for 2022 with the chance for comments and um, reinsert their new definition guidelines back in the book. Sometimes you gotta be careful what you wish for. And I think the organization that started this is probably not happy with where we ended up, but oh well. All right, so, um, and this, a split or shared visit is different from incident two services. So incident two services, I think I have it somewhere, we'll see in a minute. Incident two services in the office means that, and I'm only gonna talk about your PA nurse practitioner for this little section, means that your PA nurse practitioner is seeing a patient today. It's in, a, in the office, you're billing place of service 11 because you're a community-based private practice. So they're billing, they're seeing a patient who's an established patient that the physician has seen and established the treatment plan for whatever the PA nurse practitioner is seeing them for today. Your non-physician practitioner sees the patient for that, doesn't address any new issues, doesn't make any treatment changes. And assuming there is a doctor in the office suite to provide the direct supervision, whether the doctor sees that patient or not, you can bill that visit under the physician. So obviously there's a 15% differential in payment if you had billed it under the nurse practitioner PA. Okay. It's always kind of, been thought by a lot of people, not necessarily correctly, that if both the doctor and the nurse practitioner slash PA see the patient today, that we could bill it under the doctor. Um, and all kinds of things that, again, too much for this talk today to talk about the problems with uh, that approach from a documentation perspective. So, and that would have been considered a split or shared visit. And in your private practice where you're billing place of service 11, can you still do that? Bill under the doctor? Yes, as long as all incident two criteria, I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna switch the word. All incident two requirements are met. So even though the doctor and the nurse practitioner or PA are consulting each other and the doctor's involved, if this is a new problem, or it's about changing anything in the treatment plan, the dose of the medication, whether or not the patient needs an MRI now, you can't build that service under the physician because that's a shared visit. And um, what's the main, so this is a really important but critical change to what a split or shared visit is now. All right, so how is it defined now? CMS defines split shared visits as an evaluation and management visit in the facility setting. Place of service 21, inpatient hospital, 3132, nursing home. And that's something new that didn't exist before. Um, so that's a good thing about this is that if the doctor and the 
nurse practitioner both see the patient in the nursing home, you could actually bill under the doctor, assuming the requirements for split or shared visits are met. Um, and in the facility setting also means provider-based billing. So I'm employed by the hospital. I bill, if I'm on campus at the hospital, place of service 22. If I'm a hospital base, but I'm off campus, I bill place of service 19. I'm considered facility because the hospital is also going to send a facility bill, right? So split or shared visit is an evaluation or management visit in the facility setting that is performed by both a physician and a non-physician practitioner who are in the same group. It's not you in your private practice billing place of service 11. It is you if your doctor and your nurse practitioner or PA both go to the hospital for a hospital visit. Okay. In accordance with applicable law and regulations such that the services could be billed by either the physician or NPP if furnished independently by only one of them. Okay. So I'm in the facility, place of service 19, uh, 22, 21, 31, 32, and I'm the nurse practitioner. I've seen the patient today. The doctor has also seen the patient today. Could we bill either of our documentation alone? That's a requirement, right? So if there is enough documentation to show that the doctor could have billed the service on his or her own, um, you could bill it uh, as a shared visit. So that should tell you right now that a note that says by the doctor that says, um, uh, that um, chart reviewed, agree with um, nurse practitioners, treatment plan, doesn't tell us that the doctor even saw the patient, not enough. Okay, so how do you know who has to do what? The new definition, effective this year, is that payment will be made to the practitioner who performs the substantive portion of the visit. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that because there are two ways to determine the substantive portion this year. One is in time, actual minutes, and the other is the components of the evaluation and management uh, services code. So um, keep that substantive portion in mind. And I see the last bullet is what I just talked about already. All right, what else do you need to know? All right, whoever you're doing the billing under, that must be the person who signs the documentation. And for this year, the substantive portion can be one of the three key components, like history exam or medical decision making, or more than half of the total time. So if the total time of the visit was 25 minutes and I, the nurse practitioner, documented I spent 10 minutes with the patient and the activities for maybe a, a clinic visit, and the doctor documented her activities and that, what did I say, 10, 25 minutes, um, and um, her activities that she did and that she spent 15 minutes in that. I had 10, she had 15. You can build that 25 minute visit um, under the doctor. If we each had 12 <laughs> minutes for a 24 minute visit, uh, I'm trying to remember what they say about that. I never should have brought that up. Uh, I think it's the nurse practitioner. All right. now. This is confusing, of course, because it's going to add a component of documentation that anybody billing shared or split visits never had before. I think about all the cardiologists, here we go, the poor cardiologists again, who've had nurse practitioners for eons and you know, seeing patients with them in the hospital. Right? All of a sudden, they each have to document how much time they spent with the patient and the activities involved in that time. Um, to total it, to choose the code, and then, and then to uh, show that the wh whoever is being billed under provided the majority of the actual time. Or in the inpatient setting where there's still history exam medical decision making to choose the visit code, which one of those did the doctor perform him or herself to be considered the substantive one, one of the three key components, okay. Now, if that doesn't sound bad enough, the proposal from CMS is, was that for shared visits beginning January 1, 22, there was only gonna be one way to do it, time. And there was an uproar, understandably, from the medical community going, whoa, wait a minute, we're not used to documenting how much time anybody spends seeing a patient in the hospital, the nursing home, or in our uh, outpatient clinic. 
And the roar was so loud that CMS said, okay, okay, we'll come up with these two ways you can use. So you get used to documenting and keeping track of your time. But in 1123, the only way that you can build a shared or split visit is by who provided the majority of the actual time. So the number of minutes spent by the doctor and the number of minutes spent by the non-physician practitioner must each be documented from come 1-1-23. So what a reprieve. Um, split or shared visits can be reported for new and established patients. So if you are a hospital-based provider, know that, oh, wow, okay. So all of a sudden, because no incident two criteria apply here, right? Um, and you can do it for initial and subsequent visits in the hospital, in the nursing home, uh, and for any prolonged services. Um, so uh, being able to bill shared visits for a new patient is something new. Being able to bill uh, shared visits for prolonged services is something new. So in the circumstances where you can bill or split or shared visit, the circumstances have expanded. That's a good thing. It's just that the documentation requirements to be able to bill into the doctor, which is what everybody would like to do if they could, um, has become very confused. And that modifier FS needs to be appended to every evaluation management service or prolonged service code that has been provided as a shared or split visit regardless of who you're billing under. So let's just say you're doing something based on time and the doctor spent 10 minutes, the nurse practitioner 20 minutes, you're billing it under the nurse practitioner, you would still need to add modifier FS. For right now, um, CMS has said that they require that modifier to inform policy and help ensure program integrity. So my mind goes to, oh, sure. Now that they've done this and we have these very substantive uh, portion of the of the visit guidelines, FS is going to mean that we are going to have some audits in 2023, 2024 on claims with FS to see whether or not you did indeed have the documentation to support who provided the substantive portion. So don't even, but don't even think about not using the modifier uh, because I don't think that's gonna keep anybody safe. Plus, um, it wouldn't be a proper claim. You could find yourself going down another path that you didn't like. The difference between split and shared visits and incident two to make sure. So incident two services in the office for a non-provider based uh, physician practice. So you're not employed by the hospital. Incident two services are permissible only in the office setting and only for non-physician practitioners to bill for services under the supervising physicians number when specific supervisory and clinical requirements are met in the office suite, et cetera. New, no new problems, no new treatment, just following through on the doctor's plan of treatment. Splitter shared services are permissible in the facility setting, so hospital outpatient, hospital inpatient, nursing home, and allow physicians and non-physician practitioners to collaboratively perform evaluation and management services, right? So that's really the difference between incident two and split shared visits. This is going to bring confusion, you think, to everybody. For inpatient split or shared visits, um, ask yourself, does the non-physician practitioner and physician have to do two separate notes? Because this is a, uh, actually not ask yourself. Question I got, so wait a minute. Can they document their own face-to-face -face encounter on the same note? Each provider should document their contribution to the service with both notes indicating, oh, I see a typo, the service was, quote, performed in conjunction with the other one. Right. So and uh, Medicare has already said, hey, look, the nurse practitioner can't document for the doctor or the PA for the doctor because it's not going to show exactly what the doctor did. Um, and that's really true. Those little kind of blanket statements um, aren't going to support it. Would you consider a shared or split visit if the physician's documentation was listed as an addendum of the non-physician practitioner's note? Oh, well, yeah, sure. Doesn't have to be in the same note. Right. Um, and then um, NGS, one of the maps, had this example with the question, uh, the bottom bullet, I have seen and examined the patient with the physician assistant and agreed with the assessment and plan and physical exam findings. And then a su summary by the doctor in the doctor's note of the items and data that's um, listed by the PA that they went over, right? 
So assuming that that was all there, the physician is documenting their participation in the exam and a review of the medical decision-making. So three key components, history exam, medical decision-making. The doctor has two of the three that would be able to stand on their own. So substantive portion and be able to bill under the doctor. Now, this stuff is so situationally specific that if someone would ask me a general question like that, right? Uh, my answer would be, I can't answer until I see the note, right? So, um, and I, if I were you, I wouldn't accept an answer from anybody who would try to just wing it with a little question without seeing a note for a split or shared visits at this point. Okay, for anybody doing critical care, um, nicely, they're the same, um, the same uh, um, uh, dispute that an provider organization had about split or shared visits inured to critical care services and had a much better outcome um, because critical care was never allowed to be split or shared, et cetera. And um, that's no longer the case. So there are some uh, changes to critical care, none of them from my mind, at least, um, detrimental to anybody. So when medically necessary critical care services can be furnished concurrent to the same patient on this, concurrently to the same patient on the same day by more than one practitioner represented representing more than one specialty, you can bill it. That was never allowed, right? So a patient needs critical care from 11 through 11.50 a.m. Only one doctor prior to this year was ever allowed to bill for critical care. But if the intensivists and the cardiologists between 11 and 11.50 a.m. are both providing uh, critical care, they both have their issues they're addressing to prevent further organ failure. And their notes show that even though it is the same 50 minutes, they each get to build critical care. So that's a great thing. Um, and critical care services can be furnished as split or shared visits, right? Obviously everything I just talked about applies, except since critical care is time-based, um, what, how you would determine who to bill under for a split or shared visit, the physician, the non-physician practitioner would be who provided the substantive uh, component in time, right? Um, other, other clarification, critical care services may be paid on the same day as other evaluation and management visits by the same clinician, but only if the E&M service is provided prior to the critical care. So I go to see the patient um, in follow-up uh, follow hospital visit, um, and then later in the day, I get a call to urgently come see the patient again because they're crashing. I get to build the hospital visit from the morning, right? Based on whatever my documentation was. And assuming the documentation requirements are met, the circumstances are met, I also get to bill the critical care visit based on time later in the day when I went back to see the patient to provide some life-saving um, services, right? And modifier 25 on the earlier e &M. The opposite does not, is not allowed. So I came to see the patient, I saw the patient in critical care, provided critical care, the 99291 say for 50 minutes. And then later in the day, I saw the patient who's now stable, doing better, and I just wanted to check on them. I don't get to bill for, for an evaluation and management service later in the day. So the good, the bad, and the ugly there, right? Gene, I have a question. Yes. Gene, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, would the reimbursement uh, the change reimbursement. when when a modifier is used? No, the reimbursement for split or shared visits changes based on who it's billed under. So if it's billed under the doctor because the doctor spent the majority of the actual time providing critical care, that's 100% of the physician fee schedule allowable. Um, obviously 80% of that, right? But the allowable is the 100% if the nurse practitioner PA provided the um, substantive amount of time, so more than half of the time in critical care, which would require the critical care to be billed under the PA or nurse practitioner, um, just because their name and NPI is on the claim itself would um, have a, the reduction would be to 85% of the fee schedule. All right, so the practice must bill under the name of the treating provider who performs the substantive part of the critical care services. That's a great statement with Mindy's question, she just asked for one of you. 
and substantive portion means more than half of the cumulative total of time spent on critical care activities. Just as with any other shared services, the billing provider must sign and date the record. Um, everything else about critical care services, whether or not the, they actually work critical care, not just a complex hospital visit, et cetera, um, nothing changes there. And FS would be added to any that are billed as a split or shared visit. So um, mostly good changes because split or shared critical care just wasn't allowed in the past, right? So, so if the PA say saw the patient for 10 minutes worth of critical care and the doctor came in um, and had um, another, some critical care, but maybe didn't reach the threshold of at least 30 minutes, maybe he had 20 minutes, right? You would not before this year have been able to add the PA and the doctor's time together to bill critical care, um, but now you can. So, right. um, let's see. Uh, I think I talked about most of this. Ah, so I did talk about the surgeon being able to provide critical care uh, during the global period, if indeed it was unrelated to the surgery. There is another new modifier. Right. Not modifier 24, unrelated, uh, that we're used to for surgeons, but modifier FD, Frank Thomas, should be included on the claim to identify that the critical care is unrelated to the um, surgical procedure. That's You're still within the global period. So, all right. All right, physician assistants. So up until now, up until this year, you know, physician assistants could not um, set up their own practice. They had to they had to be only registered credential with Medicare um, in conjunction with their supervising physician, et cetera. And I remember a few several years ago, a PA here in Palm Beach County calling me to say, "Hey, Jean, myself and another PA, we want to set up our own practice that we would contract with a, and use an orthopedic PA. We want to contract with the surgeons." to provide their uh, surgical assist services and bill on our own. Can I do that? My answer was no. If they asked me today, my answer would be different because effective January 1st, 2022, um, CMS is um, implementing um, uh, Medicare changes due to, again, acts of Congress, good stuff, right? that allow direct payment to physician assistants for professional services that they furnish under Part B beginning January 1, 2022. Cool. So um, up until now, uh, Medicare could only make payment to the employer or independent contractor of a physician assistant. The VA couldn't just have their own organization and submit charges. Now they can. They can bill Medicare directly for their professional services. They can reassign payment for their services and incorporate with other PAs. So set up, yes, that practice that I was asked about several years ago, like I said, the answer now would be, yeah, you know, obviously you wanna do it right, but yes, can, do you have the uh, ability to set up a practice with another PA and be able to bill Medicare yourself? Yeah, so, um, so that's a good thing for them. Kind of gives them payment parity with the nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, et cetera. Now there's nothing for you to do right now to rush out and um, get an A55R in place for the PAs in your practice or anything. So uh, I think that will change over time, but right now the PACO system is not set up to allow uh, PAs to do this on their own. So CMS has stated in writing that uh, the MAC, so first go service options for us here, um, will know what to do when they get an A55I showing the PAs in private practice. So let's wait and see. All right, I wanted to talk about Medicare enrollment changes. <clears throat> Not that there's really anything for you to do, but there's something in the background when it comes to program integrity, i.e. weeding out, identifying fraud, waste, and abuse, that um, made me get a little nervous because I have a feeling that the majority of you on this webinar are probably not running every employee, every 1099 independent contractor, people in your billing company, if you have one, people like me, if you have a coding compliance consultant um, or firm through the Office of the Inspector General's exclusion list to make sure you're not doing business, haven't hired, 
someone who has been excluded from Medicare or any federal healthcare programs. Um, so when I spotted this enrollment change in the fee schedule role, I wanted to, um, from a compliance perspective, try to share the information. So, and the importance of this is that if you fail to do those checks and you should have someone that you're doing business with or hired and employed that has been excluded from Medicare or any other federal healthcare program, your practice's billing privileges could be revoked. Or if you're submitting an 855 form with a hard copy or through PECOS and anybody um, is excluded that meets the criteria of who those people need to be, your billing privileges could be denied. So it suddenly becomes a big deal and they, CMS, have expanded the scope of who they expect you to know whether or not they have been excluded. And I should say, if they've been excluded, that you don't keep them. All right, so the existing authority of CMS to deny or revoke providers or supplier status is if they are engaged um, or potentially engaging in fraudulent or abusive behavior. Okay, makes sense. Presenting a risk of harm to Medicare beneficiaries or the Medicare trust fund, would also make sense, or that are otherwise unqualified to furnish Medicare services or items. So expansion of CMS's authority in this year's final fee schedule rule is intended not only to clarify or strengthen certain components of the enrollment process, but also to enable CMS to take further action against providers and suppliers. So this is a proactive approach they're doing. Um, up until now, there have been a limited number of people, typically those you list on your A55 form. So the authorized official, the delegated official, each of the physicians, non-physician practitioners, um, that if they were excluded, that you could have your enrollment denied or revoked. They're expanding the categories of parties within the purview of its denial and revocation provision to include excluded administrative or management services personnel who furnish services payable by a federal healthcare program, such as a billing specialist, an accountant, human resource specialist. Now know that those are only examples. So it's your biller or coder, it's the billing company's people, um, it's finance folks, uh, it's your accountant. Uh, so you're liable to be sitting there going, well, they don't provide any services payable by a federal healthcare program. So this is where CMS is wording, their verbiage is never as straightforward as most people, including myself would like. So they don't mean that you're, what they do mean is that for any of these folks, you cannot use federal healthcare program dollars. So your Medicare reimbursement, your Medicare Advantage reimbursement, your Medicaid reimbursement to pay for these services. So keep that thought in mind. Existing reference states, quote, other healthcare personnel furnishing Medicare reimbursable services who, who is required to be reported on the enrollment application to conform to the change described in the paragraph I just read you up above, this language is being replaced with other healthcare or administrative or management services personnel. So furnishing services payable by a federal healthcare program. So when you get your check from Medicare, let's just say that it's, oh, I don't know, it's the manager's cousin, right? Who was excluded, but you know, it was, it was a wrong thing. You know, you don't agree with the fact that he should be excluded. So, you know, so there, he's on the payroll. He's doing billing. Um, the only way he could be there, if he really wanted this to happen, would be if his salary, benefits, et cetera, was paid by a fund that you put aside, a bank account that no Medicare payments went into, no Medicaid, no Medicare Advantage, no. Uh, federal Employee Health Benefit Plan, no federal health care program dollars were used to pay for his services. So that's what they mean by the pay for his services. So um, right now, if prior to this, I should say, your billing privileges would be not denied or revoked if 
you know, the authorized delegated officials, as I mentioned, you know, were um, on the list. Supervising physician for um, IDTFs, et cetera. Um, this is all expanding, or I should say, since we are now in 2022, expanding. So, so how do you avoid this? You need to check, someone in your practice needs to check the OIG's exclusion list for everybody that I just mentioned, and then some, because I don't know who's doing business with you or for you, providing services for you. Um, it's a real easy thing. I'm gonna show you how easy it is. The URL to get there is in the bottom right of this slide. Um, assuming that you haven't done this ever, you need to do it for everybody now. And then on a go forward basis, it needs to be part of your new hire process. In my little consulting firm, whether or not my staff realize it or not, because I don't need anybody's permission to do this, um, I check, put everybody through the exclusion list before they set foot in Acevedo Consulting's offices, before they get their first payroll, right? I don't expect to find anybody on the list. Um, and I print the page that says they're not on the list to PDF and save it in their personnel folder. That easy. And then I do it um, every once in a while after that. Because you know, you never know what people are moonlighting doing. All right. So, how does someone get on this exclusion list? Well, it's mandatory that they be excluded from getting paid by any federal health care program, being involved at all, if they have a fel felony conviction for substance abuse or alcohol abuse, patient abuse, fraud and abuse, sexual conduct, or if they're a licensed healthcare professional, that their license has been revoked due to any of that. Okay. So think about the um, the nursing assistant that you might hire and you go, oh, wow, she's a CNA. She actually has some better skills than our medical assistant. She'd be great to help the doctors. How does she get on the list? Well, she may have abused or neglected a patient in a nursing home. And trust me, if you were to go look for the, on the OIG's website for people who have been excluded because the exclusion list is public, right? You would find clinical clinical folks who have abused or neglected um, seniors, elderly patients, et cetera. Um, and this mandatory exclusion is for five years and sometimes for life. Permissive exclusion, so the government, the Office of the Inspector General has a little bit of um, wiggle room as to how long. So misdemeanor convictions for all the same things, so losing your license due to a misdemeanor conviction for any of these uh, substance abuse, fraud and abuse, et cetera. But look at that last one, default on a federal student loan. So I've been the compliance consultant for a good sized imaging uh, organization in the Northeast. And I remember the year that I thought in my annual compliance training for their hundred and some odd staff that I would have a little more information on this, um, this thing about the exclusions. And when I got to this slide where I said default on a federal student loan, the physician owner of the practice got up, walked over to me in the front of the room and said, looked at his all his employees and said something along the lines of, okay, before any of you default on a federal student loan, please come to me, please come to me. Maybe I can help you, all right? So the last thing he wanted was to find out that he had an employee who couldn't make payment on a federal student loan. Now he's got an excluded individual on his payroll and his billing privileges could be revoked, right? And just because the government didn't know it today that that happened, doesn't mean that the day they find out, they couldn't go back to the time um, that you should have known, et cetera, right? So, so who does this apply to? Who do you have to check? Everyone, I mean, I think that's the word. Contracted vendors, um, and my list here isn't all inclusive, obviously. Your coder, biller, medical assistant, the tech, the doctor, the PA, the nurse practitioner, your office manager, your practice manager, the billing company, um, the coding compliance firm, you know, whoever it is. Right? You, there shouldn't be anybody that doesn't get checked. A quote from the Office of the Inspector General, thus a provider or entity that receives federal health care funding, it would be you guys, may only employ an excluded individual in limited situations. Those situations would include instances where the provider is both able to pay the individual exclusively with private funds or from other non-federal funding sources and where the services furnished by the excluded individual relate solely to non-federal program patients. So that biller doesn't submit claims to Medicare only to um, Cigna or State Farm or something, right? You know, and you only pay him 
or her from the reimbursement you get from those insurance, something like that. I mean, it, there's no way you could do that. Um, so how easy is it? All right, if you go to the URL I found you, this is, I gave you, this is the page, search. And you see it's a last name and or first name. So I put myself in here for you. So I typed in Acevedo, Jean, hit search. What did I get? This page. The important delightful results are what it says above my name. No results were found. So this is the page that I print as PDF and save in my own personal file. Do I have a personal file? Um, now, sometimes you'll get a hit and it's because there are 16 Jerry Smiths. So then you just go in and you can search adding a social security number or a date of birth to make sure that it's your Jerry Smith, right? So, um, and, but that's as easy as it is. And you can search for multiple people at a time so that you don't have to go, if you have 50 employees, you don't have to go in 50 times, you have to go in a bunch of times. But, and this should only be a burden, right? If you want to call it that, this one time because you haven't never done this. So you've got to do it for everybody. And like I said, that means every one of your doctors. All right. And then keep the information. Right? If you're a large practice, there are um, organizations that do this for a fee. And paying sometimes someone to do something like this and to do it routinely um, it can indeed be a cost-saving manner, a uh, cost-saving thing, right? And um, don't assume that if you're sitting there saying, but we have, a, we have a company that does background checks on our employees, don't assume they're checking the OIG's exclusion list. This is not something that is uh, a requirement for someone working in Target or Walgreens, right? exclusion list, no federal healthcare program, um, dollars involved, et cetera. So it, unless this is a very healthcare related company that does your background checks, they may not know that the OIG exclusion list exists either. All right, but important, please do this. Therapy payment. So for those of you who um, are or have a physical or occupational therapist in your practice, unfortunately, this is the year that CMS has had to um, implement the 85%, uh, let me rephrase it, had to implement the Bi Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, which has required CMS to identify and make payment at 85% of the Medicare allowable amount for physical and occupational therapy assistance services. CMS has been actually pushing this off for, as you can see, about three years, right? They, no way they can do it any longer. If you don't have an assistant, PTA, OTA in your uh, practice, providing therapists. If you're providing therapy services, it's just a, all by a licensed physical or occupational therapist. You don't have to worry about this. Um, how will CMS know to reduce your reimbursement by 15% if you do have assistance? Because the assistants don't register with Medicare, so you need to tell them, and it is a requirement. Modifier CQ goes on each line item for services provided solely or mainly by a physical therapy assistant and CO for occupational therapy assistant. And, um, excuse me, and to not put that on when say the services were only provided by the PTA would be a false claim, right? Because you're going to get paid and it's automatically an overpayment. You're going to get paid at 100% of the uh, fee schedule amount when you should have only gotten paid for 85%. I will tell you that the formula as to how to determine whether or not you do this is really convoluted. So it's also something else that needs its own separate educational session to go slowly through everything. So there's what the CMS is calling a de minimis, de minimis threshold. So a um, couple of examples. And uh, as to whether or not you reduce I'm oh, sorry, whether or not you use the modifier. So when one unit of a time service is reported, let's look at an example. 15 minute time service codes can be billed without the CQ or CO modifier in cases where the assistant participated in the care, but the licensed therapist meets the billing requirements for the time service on their own. So 97110, um, each 15 minutes, but the physical therapist provided eight minutes of that code. Well, okay, that's the only, that one unit of 97110. Whether or not the PTA provided any of the service, 
the eight minutes allowed the physical therapist to bill on their own regardless. So no COCQ modifier, nothing to reduce. Two units. So let's just say the 97110 times two. So here's where it starts to get a little bit, bit of the what? What are they talking about type thing? So one 15 minute unit may be billed with the modifier and one may be billed without it, depending on the time component, right? So assume that uh, um, the PT and the PTA each provide between nine and 14 minutes of the same service. And the total time is at least 23 minutes which would be two units, but no more than 28, because more than that would be three units. So just two minutes. Okay, so the first unit was met by the physical therapist provided at least the eight minutes, but then the total time, the physical therapy assistant provided more than 50%, what the heck do we do? So there's the little example, 97110, uh, with the GP modifier to tell the payer, tell Medicare that the service is provided under a physical therapy plan of treatment. But the second unit, because um, more than half of the time was provided by the assistant, 97110 again with the CQ modifier and the GP with a unit of one. Oh my God, this is going to be such a mess, guys. Now, for those of you who have no physical therapy, don't know anything about therapy billing, you should, I'm asking you to understand that the therapy programs are not highly profitable. These are not huge money makers. There's not a lot of reimbursement in therapy services. The independent practices um, are not rolling in dough, so to speak, right? Um, this is really going to have a detrimental impact, I believe, on access. And I don't know, only time will tell what the heck happens to the um, physical and occupational therapy assistance services over time. Oh, well. Um, and then of course, when you must bill the CQ or CO modifier, when the assistant independently furnishes the service. So, you know, I go to my physical therapy and only the PTA provides services. Well, obviously a CQ modifier has to be on that because they've provided the, oh, the entire service, right? So it needs to be uh, the payment needs to be reduced um, in a, for a code that doesn't have 15 minutes in its definition because it's uh, time-based, but the, ther the therapy assistant provides it. You still add the, the, uh, the C modifier. Um, when the assistant furnishes eight minutes or more of the final 15-minute unit, right? So they would have provided the majority of it and have to put the CO, CQ modifier. And when both the assistant and the licensed therapist each furnish less than eight minutes for the final 15 minutes. So, um, so we both furnish uh, seven minutes, so 14 minutes of the final unit. Since no one provided more than half, it, def it uh, defaults to the assistant level billing, right? So it gets reduced. It's really a mess. I don't know how these poor folks are going to be documenting this in their practice. All right, telehealth, I think we're winding down. So um, a few changes in telehealth, know that as long as we have the public health emergency, everything you've been doing, assuming you've been doing it right and have understood the guidelines and the requirements and your clinicians have been documenting accordingly, um, nothing's changing, right? But there are a couple of uh, nuanced changes one of which this first one that I thought was required all along. So for audio only services, um, the, um, the, the final rule stated that it permits the use of audio only communication technology under certain circumstances for mental health services provided via telehealth to beneficiaries who are in their own homes. So it's limited, right? So it's if you're a psychologist, psychiatrist, licensed clinical social worker doing telehealth um, and you're doing telephone only, remember there's that modifier I pointed out earlier, uh, it's only under certain circumstances. So, and, and they must be, which is what I think all of you must be able to document for audio, audio only, is that what is the reason 
for using audio only. For any of you who kind of follow the evolution of telehealth from 2020, oh my goodness, in March when it first started changing and they started to allow telehealth, after a couple of months when providers were telling CMS, wait, what do I do with the patients who don't have internet access, don't have a smartphone? They have a smartphone, but they can't figure out FaceTime or DocsyMe or WhatsApp. Um, you're telling me I can bill for office visits when I see them via telehealth, but you said audio video. And sometimes I spend more time on the phone with these patients who don't have the technology or the ability to use it. What do I do for those? And so CMS had said, where those circumstances exist, lack of internet access, the patient doesn't have a smartphone or computer, et cetera, et cetera, you can do telephone only. So I've always assumed that you had to document why the patient was telephone only. And now that requirement is, um, is a requirement. Um, they also finalized a revised time frame for inclusion of certain services added to the telehealth list that were originally temporary. So some things that were supposed to expire either last year or when the, the public health emergency ended, CMS has said in the rule, which was a great thing, I'm paraphrasing now, you know, things have changed. There were just a few thousand, tens of thousands of telehealth encounters prior to this pandemic. Now there've been millions. Something tells me we're not put, gonna put this uh, genie back in the bottle. So um, we need to give ourselves in Congress time to figure out what we're gonna keep permanent. So we're gonna keep most of these services in place as they are through December 31st, 2023 to give everybody time to work on it. So that's a, another great thing. And I really don't see how they're putting this genie back in the bottle. Thank goodness. I don't know about you, but for certain encounters with one of my doctors where I really don't need a physical exam, I love not having to get in my car and drive a half an hour, or sit in the waiting room and drive a half hour back. I'm working, right? And I've lost over an hour now of my work time, right? So I love just being able to do it. Um, and in fact, in some instances, I think I get more one-on-one -on -one personalized care because they're at their computer looking only at me. So um, anyway, that's just me, I, but I digress. Right? So, so that's a good thing. Plus there are some car cardiac and intensive cardiac rehab codes that will continue to be available through the Medicare telehealth on a temporary basis or until the end of December, 2023. Virtual check-in. Now, I don't see too many people doing this. You know, this was that code G2012 that came out 2019, I think, that was five to 10 minutes where the doctor or the non-physician practitioner was actually on the phone with the patient, responding to the patient's call. You know, the MA may have told them, hey, Gina Acevedo called, she wants to talk to you. So the doctor, the nurse practitioner actually called me back and it was just to see what the next steps are or do I need an office visit, right? Uh, maybe it's, uh, I've called because, you know, I've been having a headache and, you know, you started this new medication. What do you think, doc? Is that a reaction to the medication? Do I need a visit? So he calls me back, spends about five, six minutes with me on the phone, asking my symptoms and says, nope, you know, I don't think this has anything to do with that. You should be fine. If the headache continues, give me a call next week. That's a billable service, G2212, five to 10 minutes, virtual check-in, just to see what the next steps. So CMS actually realized, in listening to the medical community, that, hey, CMS, there are an awful lot of patients that five to 10 minutes is not enough. I spend 15, 20 minutes sometimes on the phone with some of these patients trying to figure out what their next steps are. So they had created another HCPCS code last year, G2252, which is the same virtual check-in, only 11 to 20 minutes. Right? And that's going to um, stay as a permanent uh, virtual check-in code. Now, both of these, if you're sitting there going, oh, I didn't know that. Um, besides obviously documenting the conversation, the amount of time must be documented, right? They're both time-based codes, five to 10 minutes for G2012, 11 to 20 minutes, G2252. The only thing that could show that you build correctly would be documenting the amount of time. So, so that's also a good thing. All right, it's a lot of information. So what are some of the things that I wanna drive home? For your coding, read the guidelines. 
parenthetical notes, please, someone in your coding billing, the manager needs to go to the CPT code book and the sections that you know the doctor's services are primarily billed from. Look to see, is there something that she needs to know, right? That you need to know from a billing perspective that the clinicians need to know so that they're not providing a service that they think is covered the way they're documenting it only to find out that there was a tweak and that if they had an audit, they'd have to pay back money because there was this new thing they needed to say or do, right? Um, make sure the information is distributed amongst everybody that needs to know. Um, and whether you have a compliance program or the practice philosophy is just, she said facetiously, to do the right things right, you need to check the OIG's list of exclusions. Um, that really scares me because I know that most practices don't do that. Uh, and every year I read a handful of cases where there have been huge fines and penalties assessed, sometimes to small practices who have realized that holy expletive, so-and-so is excluded. In fact, there's a small radiology group here in Southeast Florida that a few years ago um, hired a biller, brother of one of the radiologists. And after he was there for about six months, I forget how they found out that he'd been excluded from the Medicare program. Right? And obviously he's submitting claims to Medicare and they didn't have any separate accounts. I mean, plus nobody does that. So um, they spoke to their healthcare lawyer and they did a um, they did a self disclosure to the federal government. It cost them money, but it was a lot less painful than if someone had found out, or if they had a whistleblower, someone who told the government that hey, Harry's excluded and he's working in the practice, right? So um, don't assume. And as I said, don't assume the company that does your new hire background checks is checking this, right? Take a take an afternoon, you know, pull out your pull up your you know list of employees, independent contractors, any quote unquote vendors that you use, billing companies, you know, compliance, uh, chart audit consultants, et cetera, and make sure you run everybody through, save the results to PDF. And I'm hoping they're all negative results. If you just put first and last names in, if you get a hit, as I call it, um, check the per person's date of birth, social security number in case there's a, there's another Gene Acevedo who didn't walk the straight and narrow path. Um, in addition, um, educate, educate, educate. It's all about education, right? So especially now with the split shared visits, if you have non-physician practitioners and you bill sometimes under the doctor when they both see the patient, um, you need to understand what that is. And the coding and billing staff, again, need to understand. You do not have to be a um, certified coder to look at a visit note and be able to see whether or not the doctor documented anything herself so that the visit shouldn't be billed under her, or that if it's a time-based visit that the doctor provided 10 minutes and the nurse practitioner provided 12 minutes of the visit, so clearly you can't bill under the doctor. Um, so, and if you're a specialty practice, consider implementing principal care management, especially if you think back and you go, yeah, we have a number of patients who are what we call the time, the time consumers, right? We're always on the phone. They're always having problems. They're um, their atrial fib is always out of control, or we've got them on a new medication and a loop recorder, and we really want to be in touch with them a lot during the course of the month to make sure they're doing all right. It doesn't have to be forever, right? So um, do the uh, principal care management can be a, a big help. And then for telehealth, since everybody's still providing it, at least that everybody I've been in contact with, um, be on the alert for the uh, Secretary of HHS's notice, her, hopefully, that within days, actually, because the 16th is when? Is Sunday. So um, very soon, we should know that, hopefully, that the, uh, the public health emergency has been extended, right? So, um, and if you're interested or wonder, okay, so what are all the covered telehealth services? Make sure we're doing this right because the list has changed so, I never want to provide the list, but the last bullet there is the URL so you can go and look yourself as to what the current services are. All right, Mindy, I'm done. <laughs> A lot of information, hopefully something for everybody. My brain is exploding. <laughs> <laughs>
I say when Jean speaks, it's like Chinese. I just nod and, and I you guys come up with some intelligent questions. Um, does anyone have any questions that I can put them in the chat room? I know we had one that she couldn't answer, but we'll get back to yep. you on that. Not a problem. And um, Denise or Lise, are either one of you still on the call? I know they were earlier. If they wanted to give a little plug for joining the MGMA, um, we'd, we'd love you to, to say a few words. And Jean, you always speak well about MGMA. You want to say something on their behalf? or? Oh, yeah. Well, in this day and age, if you think about if you think about everything I talked about, right? And there's more in the rule, right? And obviously there are a lot more codes. Um, I don't know how any of you can survive managing a practice on your own. It really does take a village. And the Medical Group Management Association has been around for eons. Um, it is a great support system. It's a great um, uh, organization for uh, knowledge. It's, Incredible. Um, there needs to be somewhere in addition to the medical society, right? In addition to what you just read and try to interpret yourself, that you have as an organization to join that um, that has the same problems you do. So you can actually say, "What the heck are you doing about X?" Right? So, yeah, it's a great organization, but not better than the medical society, Jean. No, totally, but totally different, but totally Absolutely. different perspective. Totally, totally different, different animals. Yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, we can't hear you, Dee. Dee, you're muted. I'm unmuted. Hey, thank you, Jean. And um, thank you for sharing some pearls of wisdom with the MGMA. We work very closely. We co-host these meetings. So we have a great relationship with them. And I know Denise and Lisa were on. They may have had to jump off. I want to thank Jean. And remind you all, we have next month's meeting, which right now it's in person. I don't know what's going to happen by February 9th. I have my doubts. It may turn into a Zoom meeting. We have Christine Hall speaking on staying compliant with telehealth. So oh, it'll Great add topic. on to what Jean and, and, and uh, Christine used to work with Jean. So, you know, she's a goodie. She doesn't, she only has <laughs> sharp, sharp people working for her. Yeah. So um, you can register that online right now. Register in person. If we switch it to Zoom like we had to do with Jean, uh, we'll let you know. And then you can re-register for that. But thanks. Be well. Be safe. Um, and again, thank you, Jean. And uh, y'all have a great day. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and healthy.